Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another episode of You've Got the Power here on RegenX TV. Today, we're broadcasting from the Centeno Schultz Facebook page. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch. Of course, I'm here with the great Dr. Chris Centeno, founder of the RegenX Network and uh, chief medical officer of the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Colorado. Dr. Centeno, great afternoon to you. Good to see you, Jason. You know, let's kick off today's show. If you're just joining us, uh, this is the time and place you get to ask the world's foremost expert, Dr. Chris Centeno, uh, expert on orthobiologics and helping people with significant orthopedic injuries and concerns uh, do everything they can to avoid drugs and surgery by helping the body heal itself using the body's own natural healing factors. I know there's a lot of controversy about this. You know, my background training is as a chiropractor, and uh, I know there's a lot being written about chiropractors who are in some way entering this field. Uh, I may call it sort of uh, expanding their lanes inappropriately. I do not support chiropractors, in fact, doing these procedures per se. Um, I think that the, the right way to do it, just for the record, for my chiropractor friends and any others is, Chiropractors should do chiropractic work. Medical doctors, osteopaths should keep on moving in the direction of finding more organic, natural, drug-free ways to avoid the dangerous, invasive, risky, expensive stuff when it's possible. And where chiropractors and medical doctors and DOs can work together and co-manage people to help them get the best of both worlds without going into each other's lanes is really the way I'll say is my stand on the subject, just to put it out there. You recently did a blog post with multiple videos I found fascinating. Uh, let's just sort of, you know, get into what's going on out there from your perspective and what do people really need to know to make sure they're getting the right care from the right type of provider. Yeah, and I agree with you as well, uh, Jason. I work with a lot of chiropractors and in fact, it was a local chiropractor who sent me an email uh, about a Dr. Brim Hall course. I didn't know who this guy was. Apparently, he's a, he does a lot of courses in chiropractic. And uh, this was really fascinating because I dove into a little bit. It, it, I called up the place and said, hey, if I want to attend this course, because there's one here in Colorado in October, what qualifications do I need? That was the first thing. The answer was no qualifications. You mean I can be a nurse practitioner, a PA, a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, a physician? Yeah, anything goes. So that was interesting because when we have courses to inject delicate structures, and that's what this course was about, how to inject stem cells in the spinal neuraxis. So what that means is things like intrathecal inside the spinal canal. Uh, we wouldn't let just anyone walk in. In fact, we wouldn't even let a neurosurgeon walk in because they don't have training in that lane. So uh, I was interested. I did some more research. Uh, I found some videos online, uh, interestingly, of the course, which didn't make a lot of sense to me why they were online, but they were online. So I downloaded them and watched them. And what I saw blew my mind. It uh, blew my mind not only because the injections that were being described were faked. And what I mean by faked is that, you know, the guy said he was performing a facet injection. He was nowhere near the facet joint. Uh, it was a blind injection with a needle far too short to get there. But then my mind was blown again because I saw him stick a needle in the cervical spine, uh, trying to get inside the spinal canal or intrathecal and inject anesthetic there. And thankfully, the guy was big enough and his needle was too short. He never got even close to inside the spinal canal. But had this been a smaller woman uh, who was thin and just small boned, uh, he would have killed this woman. I mean, that, that's it's just I can't say it any other way. Or at least she would have lost the ability to breathe uh, or could have lost the ability to breathe and then would have needed to be resuscitated. Uh, by an advanced ACLS crew to make sure that she could keep getting oxygen until that anesthetic wore off. Because when you inject stuff intrathecal or inside that spinal canal and inside the dura covering of those nerve roots, it can go into the high upper cervical area and numb out your ability to breathe. 
Um, now, you know, listen, every spinal interventionist that's done cervical work may have had that happen once or twice on them, but that's why they have advanced ACLS capabilities to make sure that that person can keep breathing until the stuff wears off and everything's fine. But this was done in a hotel room. I saw an oxygen bottle in the corner. I was pretty sure there was no one in the hotel room that had had an advanced ACLS certification to actually resuscitate this person. So it was a mind blower because not only were these faked injections, uh, the kind you can expect at many of these chiropractors who uh, get outside their lane, but also that what I saw was frankly frightening and dangerous and uh, could threaten someone's life. Let's break it down just a little bit more. You know, one of the main reasons we continue to do this program week after week as a public service for you is so that you have the power to make the right decisions for yourself, your family. Hopefully you're inviting more people who you know have orthopedic conditions to continually watch this program to empower yourself. So let's let's again just sort of break it down a little bit you know more number one you know my background my stand again sort of representing the chiropractic side of things is chiropractors really shouldn't be injecting things you know that's my position on the statement you know we are experts at making spinal adjustments i'll even go so far as to make adjustments to extremities but we help maintain the alignment uh, of joints whether that's the spine or extremities specifically so that we can release the pressure that it may be having on the nerve system. That's, that's our focus, that's our specialty. Nobody does that better than we do. Outside of that <laughs> is what we'll call outside of our lane, in most cases, most of the times. Now that doesn't mean you can't get nutritional advice or exercise advice or lifestyle recommendations from a chiropractor, but when you start going in the direction of more invasive treatments, like using needles, like using drugs, you know, prescription drugs, whether it's anesthesia or any other type of prescription drugs, uh, you know, I'm going to put on the record my sense of that is that should be and is outside of our lane. Let's get in. So there's two issues I, I believe you're bringing up, Doc, which is one, you know, chiropractors really shouldn't be doing this. I agree. Two, uh, it's not limited to chiropractors. Let's move it back into the reality of, you know, safe and effective versus unqualified people of any profession, whether they're medical doctors or any other kind of professional, taking a weekend course and learning how to stick a needle with drugs into your spinal cord is something that should bring up lots of red flags for all of you. Uh, to go, hold on a minute, uh, this isn't just an injection, you know, just under the skin surface, this is your spinal cord. <laughs> so, Doc, I guess let's, let's talk about, you know, when done right, how powerful this is when it's done correctly, but as you said, how dangerous it is when people are doing it incorrectly. Uh, and ultimately, let's sort of just bring it back to, and we'll get to questions in just a moment, um, let's get back to you know, what is it that people need to know, need to ask, or need to think about when they're making this decision as to who they should see for these types of services? Clearly, the answer is get to a Regenex affiliate center, specifically Centeno Schultz. But we know there's lots of people saying lots of things. So how does the public navigate and understand, you know, fact versus fiction, safe versus risky and unsafe? Yeah, so this is a little bit like, you know, uh, what comes to mind is I was uh, on, a, on a trip with family in, in Europe and on every street corner, they've got guys selling fake Gucci bags or fake YSL bags. You know, these are two, three, four, five thousand dollar bags if they were real and they're selling them for 20 bucks. Um, and so obviously you look at these bags and you can see it's not the real deal, but it looks passable enough and it'll fall apart in two weeks, but you only paid 20 bucks for the bag. So, and you know, it's a fake, you know, no one's selling $5,000 Gucci bags on the side of the street for 20 bucks. It's a little bit like that other than uh, there's charging the 5,000 bucks and you as a consumer really don't know if you're getting something that's real or fake. So uh, what I saw in this video, let's say, let's start with something simple, a fake uh, 
low back facet injection. So what does that really look like? That really looks like someone who has a procedural suite with either x-ray or ultrasound or both. And they are carefully guiding a, a long spinal needle, depending on how heavy you are, heavier meaning longer needles, thinner meaning smaller needles, into a facet joint, and then documenting that the stuff is getting there. And then they can inject PRP or stem cells or whatever. Who should that person be? That person should be someone who has extensive training in spinal injections. It should not be a nurse practitioner. It should not be a physician's assistant, which is very common in these chiro clinics. It should not be an acupuncturist. It should not be a chiropractor, uh, and, or it should not be a naturopath. Uh, and that's the spectrum of, of what, uh, what I see or the providers I see that are doing these faked procedures, because learning how to do that actual facet injection for real takes an entire year fellowship. Uh, and sometimes longer than that to get good at it. But just to learn it takes a year. That's not something you go to a weekend course to learn. Uh, so that's the first thing is who's doing the injecting. And it shouldn't be a mid-level. It should be a uh, physician super specialist who's done this thousands of times and had years of training to do it. Uh, and it should be done, again, not in a chiropractic office or a regular exam room without guidance, but in a dedicated procedural suite. Uh, and you walk in there and you see all the fancy equipment and you see the, you know, the breathing stuff and the crash cart. You see a big CR machine. You see ultrasound machines. Y you know you're in a procedural room. Uh, you're not doing this just in a back office or a little, little exam room. So those are some of the things to, to look for to try to make sure that you're not the victim of one of these crazy fake injections. There you go. So if you've got questions, we've got answers. That's what we're here for. Buyer beware. Pay attention. Do your research. And uh, when it comes to healthcare, cheaper is often not better. And you've just got to do your research to understand what's going on. And go ahead, Doc. And many, and many times, the bizarre thing about this is that these are cheaper. In fact, many times they're more expensive than getting someone like me to actually do this procedure, which is the bizarre part, meaning that, you know, a PRP injection lumbar spine for a lot of different areas might be uh, $4,000 if I do it. But if you go to the chiropractor down the street who's going to do a fake version of that, the fake Gucci on the side of the road, it's not 20 bucks. It's 8,000 bucks. Yeah. So, uh, so you're not so really, go ahead. Dead stem cells, fake injection. Yeah, dead stem cells, fake injection. So that's the bizarro about all of this. It's not like you're getting a deal here. You're not. That, that, that's exactly the point. And, and just to clarify, just the word fake, because it's used so much these days. Uh, you know, the, the misperception is that it's a fake injection, as in they're not injecting you. They are injecting you. It is fake from the standpoint that the materials they're using don't have the, uh, I'll say, healing power or healing factor that they are claiming for it to have. Is that the distinction? I mean, they are injecting you. It's a well, like just like a fake bag is still a real bag. We got two different. <laughs> yeah, we got two different levels there. One is uh, what's being injected is fake stem cells. So that's that's rampant right now. We've talked about that on this show before. The other is the actual injection technique is faked, uh, which is what I'm talking about here, meaning that uh, they're claiming they're putting this stuff in a damaged facet joint, for example, but they're nowhere near the facet joint. They're sitting in a muscle. So they're doing a muscle trigger point injection versus confirming they're getting those cells into that joint or intrathecal, like I said, inside the spinal canal, around the spinal cord, but inside the covering of the spinal cord, that's called intrathecal, they're nowhere near that. And why are they offering it intrathecal? They're offering it intrathecal for people who have serious neurologic diseases, ALS, MS, things like that, uh, because they've read someplace that getting it intrathecal might help those people, because then it goes up to the brain. The problem is they're nowhere near intrathecal. They're literally just injecting into the soft tissues and calling it an intrathecal injection. So again, what's being ejected is fake. 
and what and where they're putting it, meaning the procedure itself is faked. I watched, I watched the video uh, on your blog post. If you want more information about this topic, then go to the regenx.com. Click on the blog. You'll see it was just, I believe it was yesterday, maybe the day before. You can watch. Uh, I, was, I was amazed when you were just sort of narrating over the video uh, and you could see the bulge in the skin uh, clearly showing yeah. that the, you know, whatever was in there wasn't going inside the body. It was just layering on top. I mean, there's just, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or an MD researcher to figure this all out. So uh, let's get to questions again. If you've got more, if you want more information about that, whether you're a professional or a consumer, go check out the Regenex blog and really subscribe to it. I mean, it's fascinating every day to get an insider's look from a top researcher uh, as to how to think about these things. And I know Dr. Centeno takes questions. Um, so it's a great place if you've got questions we aren't able to answer here. Dr. Centeno will on occasion go long format and really uh, sort of put together the case for uh, answering those questions there. Speaking of questions, let's head on over to our questions and we thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Terry is saying hello from Michigan. I'm saying hello from California. Welcome and thank you for Colorado. Watching. There you go. Hey, Kimberly. Uh, she says, hola from La Paz, Mexico. Saw Dr. Mova in Dallas recently. PRP first to calm nerve endings and a few days later he harvested my bone marrow injected into two discs. Pain is completely gone, gentlemen. Cheers to the experts, regenx.com. Kimberly, we thank you so much for your endorsement and just simply sharing your positive experience. Uh, we as doctors can talk every day, all day, and we do, uh, about the positive benefits of the things that we do. Um, but when people who have experienced our care are the ones who speak up and go, worked for me, this was awesome, uh, you know, real people, real results, that's oftentimes what people need to hear about other people's experience to just sort of go, okay, I believe them. You know, of course, we're going to tell you it's great. But when you hear people's experience, sharing it with you like you did, Kimberly, that oftentimes is the difference. So thank you for your generosity and for speaking up. And I'll invite those of you that have had positive experiences to please do the same. It makes a difference. All right, we've got Irna. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Uh, hi, I had an ORIF on ankle 14 weeks ago and having an appointment with Regenex specialist. Let's continue this here. This week for possible injection treatment for my healing ligament. Is it not too early for this procedure? Uh, no, that doesn't sound too early at all to me. So uh, just so that everyone knows, uh, ORIF is that kind of surgery where they go in and they plate uh, a fracture, let's say. Uh, so rather than putting you in a big cast and leaving you there for three months, they'll go ahead and put a plate around the fracture uh, to try to get it to heal, you can put more weight more quickly on that area. Now, one of the biggest things that happens with that kind of trauma is if you think about it, if you had enough force to get a fracture, frequently you have enough force to damage the ligaments that hold joints together. But really, the bright, shiny object, obviously, is the fracture. So they're working on the fracture. So we've seen countless patients who, are stat who have had those surgeries for fractures where their ligaments were never really assessed or looked at uh, properly, and they have continued pain, and then we can go in, diagnose that ligament issue, and fix that ligament issue. But I think you're right in the right time zone to get that done. That is awesome. And, and an important thing to realize, and it, it's one of the limitations of specialists, is they think of one specific thing. So yes, you're aligning the bone and stabilizing the bone so it can heal, but you don't address all the other issues that had to have most likely gotten injured during, whether it was a, you know, a twist or whatever trauma happened to the body, the trauma tends not to happen to just the bone. <laughs> so you've got to make sure you're addressing the systems as they work together. And that's one of the important things to keep in mind. Uh, let's keep going. We've got uh, Jason, great name, Jason, my name too. Uh, he says, I want the Cairo who sends me down the path not the one who wants to milk me for half a decade with adjustments when they know they can't fix me. A chiropractor isn't doing any kind of injection near my spine. Well, you know, I am a big fan of lifetime chiropractic care. Some do it for injuries, other do it for the promotion of health. 
but they should not be injecting anything into your spine. I wholeheartedly agree with you. So Jason, thanks for sharing. And, uh, and we agree completely hundred percent. Terry says, uh, are spine surgeons qualified to do epidural injections, L3, L4, under fluoroscopy for herniated discs with osteoporosis? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, there are spine surgeons that have gone back for additional training in how to do uh, uh, x-ray guided epidurals as an example. Uh, but they have to go back and get that additional training. There's nothing about spine surgery training that would allow you to do those procedures without additional training. So those, those spine surgeons are out there. Uh, they're kind of few and far between, actually. So there's just a few of them that have gotten that extra training. And, and I'll give you an example. We had, uh, when I way back when, when I used to be part of the Interventional Orthopedics Foundation, uh, that's an organization I helped to found and now have since moved on from, and lots of other doctors are being president of this organization and running it. But way back then, we had a neurosurgeon call up and said, I want to enter this uh, regenerative medicine spine course. And I asked him some questions, asked him if he had been trained in any of these procedures. No, no, no. But how hard could they be? And I, I just said, listen, you know, you got to go back and get the basic training before you're qualified to take this course, which really insulted him. But listen, it's a different set of skills. And like I said, there are some surgeons out there that have gone back and learned those skills, but most have not. Let's go a little bit deeper here if we can, because, you know, there's a couple ways to interpret this question the way I'm reading it. Um, you know, one is, are they qualified to physically do the injection? That's one thing. Um, the second thing really is, are they qualified to really understand the best orthobiologic type procedures? using stem cells uh, or PRP as a solution. And that's where it's not just the physical skill of the doctor, it's also the philosophy of the doctor. Do you want to maybe just sort of elaborate a little bit on the difference between, you know, the, the trend for current surgeons in many cases um, to want to add this because so many people are asking about it. So they kind of use it as an accessory as opposed to using it as a way to, in fact, in many cases, avoid the actual really expensive, dangerous stuff they would otherwise be doing? Yeah, and I wrote a little bit about that this weekend on a blog. A patient uh, had asked, you know, what makes Regenix so special? So I came up with 10 different things. And one of those things was just what you're talking about there. And that is that at Regenix, we're not afraid to upset the surgical apple cart. And what I mean by that is that Listen, it's very hard these days. Uh, you go and see a surgeon and you get a surgical opinion about whether or not you need surgery. That's what that surgeon does and that's what they're good at. Now, the problem is that if, you, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you, you're more likely to get a surgical opinion. Obviously, if you see someone whose job it is to help you avoid surgery, uh, like a Regenix provider, you're going to get uh, a different point of view. And sometimes we're going to say, you know what, get the surgery because we can't help you. Uh, but about two thirds of the time or so, we're going to say, we think we can help you avoid that surgery. Now, that's a different point of view than the surgeon who might just use a little bit of this or that because patients are asking for these procedures versus the surgeon's job being to try to put himself out of business. And that's really what we take very seriously at Regenix. That's why we're getting insurance coverage for these procedures with select employers, because those employers realize that we can move those people from the surgical column into the non-surgical column. As a surgeon, is that really your job? Well, we have surgeons that are part of the Regenix network, but they've imbibed that idea. They're very special surgeons. For most surgeons, not really my job. I'll try a little of this. I'll try a little of that. Doesn't work. You're going to surgery. So it's a different point of view. It really is. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the uh, cardiac surgeons who are starting to teach lifestyle in order to, you know, after years and years uh, of doing these reactive procedures, knowing, you know, the many years they earned their way there. Uh, it is very difficult for most surgeons to give up their primary source of income. Um, even when they philosophically agree with the premise, 
that, uh, you know, if people would change their lifestyles, they wouldn't end up needing these surgeries. Uh, it becomes, I guess I'll just call it a financial trap of sorts. It's just the reality of the world that we're living in right now. Um, well, so there you have it. Thank you for your uh, question, Terry. Let's keep going. We've got Doug. Doug's a regular viewer. Thanks for watching. He says, I have a plantar plate injury in my foot. Hasn't healed after three months. Is PRP a viable treatment option to help me? Yeah, Doug, we treat plantar plate uh, issues pretty frequently at Centeno Schultz. So basically, um, that's an ultrasound guided procedure. Sometimes I'll use x ray to enhance what we're doing as well. Uh, just so that people know, uh, the plantar plates are at the bottom of the foot at those toe joints, those, uh, you know, the main toe joints. And they're there, there's sort of an extra thickening of the bottom of the capsule of those joints. Makes sense. You put a lot of force on that area, so your body has to really beef that area up. And you can get an injury in that plantar plate where the toe joint becomes unstable. So it's usually PRP. Every once in a while, if it's more severe, we'll use bone marrow. But usually an ultrasound-guided PRP injection into that plantar plate works very well. That would be uh, a next step, Doc, would be a uh, telehealth or live consult with you. Uh, what would be the best way for him to uh, reach out and make that appointment? Yeah, uh, that would work. Um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of telehealth these days, reviewing the MRI with the patient online, getting the history online, et cetera, even a self exam at home that you can do to give us more information. So that's usually a good next step. Dynamite. Doug, make it happen. Thanks for your question. Appreciate it. All right, we've got a question that was asked in advance. Uh, by Jocelyn Rose. And uh, Jocelyn asks, wouldn't it be against the law to be doing something as dangerous as things like fake stem cell injections? <laughs> Doc, I'll let you have that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> Jocelyn. Oh, God. I, I, uh, you know, the, the answer is yes. So uh, in this particular case, there was a guy who was claiming to be an MD, PhD, who had, uh, who was the one who was teaching this course. I couldn't find a valid MD license or PhD license on this guy. Certainly, if you're a chiropractor, uh, unless you're in a very few states that have expanded scope chiropractic, you can't be doing these injections. And even in those states with expanded scope chiropractic, those practice acts would never contemplate injecting inside the spinal canal, for example. So you're, again, outside your scope, which is illegal. Um, same thing with naturopaths doing these injections in many states. Same thing with acupuncturists doing these injections in many states. The problem I have found is that it's a little bit of a regulatory gray area. And it's not a gray area at all with, if you read the rules, but who do you complain to? So as an example, there was a naturopath in Utah who, in my opinion, was clearly outside of his practice act who was injecting the spine just like this and doing many similar things, uh, tried to go to the naturopathic board. Uh, he sits on that naturopathic board. Um, so they didn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Tried to go to the Utah Medical Board. They're like, that's really a naturopathic board thing. Um, so it's this weird thing. Technically, it's practicing medicine without a license, in my opinion, uh, from reviewing the practice acts. But who's going to prosecute it? It probably has to be the medical board. Uh, but the medical board didn't seem interested in it. They just deferred it to the naturopathic board. So it's a little bit of this, you know, hot potato, one guy thrown it to the other guy, thrown it to the other guy. And no one's really willing to hold on to the potato and figure out what's going on. So that's why it's happening. It's uh, it's a way of the world right now, whether it's, uh, you know, an actual, you know, potential crime, whether it's a mental health issue. We're just living in a world right now where our resources are extended and it's very difficult for organizations and associations uh, to do something that hasn't already happened. Meaning until they actually injure someone and there is an event yeah. uh, to go, here's, a, you know, OK, now we can prosecute a bad event. Uh, it's it's difficult to expend resources in, in all kinds of categories. So 
Um, we're, we're just in difficult times. And that, again, reiterates and reinforces why it's so important for you to do your research. And again, one of the things to, to really make sure is clear here, because I, we get these questions week after week after week. And one of the things I want to make sure people are hearing is that there's it's great to be informed, but people sometimes get to the other side of informed and start making decisions they're often not capable of making because you do need a medical degree and you need experience with patients to really understand not just the differences, for example, between PRP and stem cells and you know the ability to decide for yourself what you should have, as much as doing your research about what these things are and who you can trust to guide you through this maze of figuring out what actions should I take that are in my best interest. It is absolutely best, even as doctors, to have a doctor who's a guide. So part of this is understanding what you're dealing with. Nobody's saying, ah, just leave it up to the doctor and believe whatever they say. That's not the point. The point is to have enough information so that when a doctor helps guide you as a partner, you know what they're guiding you towards. You know the differences between option A and option B, and together you can partner into the best decisions. Does that sound like an accurate approach to you, Doc? Yeah, uh, like like we said, I mean, regrettably, until something awful happens, it seems unlikely that many of these things will get dealt with. And that's awful because, frankly, um, you know, I just reached out to someone I knew in the press about this because it's it's frustrating to have to be in a situation where it's going to take someone dying uh, in order for someone to focus on this. Now, at that point, you know, the VA all over the face of whatever board it was and whatever state it was. Um, but it's frustrating, yeah. And and that leaves patients to be able to try to figure out um, how to protect themselves because it doesn't look like the state medical boards are going to protect you. And that's, that's not good, that's a bad thing, but uh, they're probably gonna wait for something really bad to happen before they act. They're, they're tough to positions to be in. And, and I'm going to just go just a step further. We'll get to your question in just a moment, Eric. But, but Doc, this question's come to me from, from colleagues I know and so on. And that is, uh, what, what drives you? What, you know, you're an amazing doctor. You're a researcher. You're an innovator. You're certainly plenty busy. And you, know, you don't have to work another day in your life to be able to support yourself. So what, what is it that really drives you to not only do a great job in your practice with the people you work with, but to also advocate for you know, both consumers and other colleagues uh, for the right thing you know, proactively. It takes a lot of your time, a lot of your energy, many of your writings, your blogs, your videos are in essence about policing the industry. What, what drives you to do that? You know, it's a good question. I can only tell you you know, how it feels for me personally, you know, back in 2005, we were the first people on earth to do many of these procedures. Uh, and I think what I predicted was a rational actor world. And what I mean by that and, uh, is that this industry would follow very much like interventional spine, where what happened is you had some founders who started doing these procedures, they took anesthesia procedures, they made them more complex, moved them for imaging guidance. And then you had organizations jump in who then decided on guidelines. And it was pretty much a rational actor world as these things uh, laid out there and doctors adopted them and started doing them. Uh, and we had some of that of regenerative medicine, but then it just took this really weird turn where all of a sudden you had uh, you know, for lack of a better term, scam artists get involved in this whole thing. And so I think it, it's, it's personal uh, to some degree because you know, I started this field and instead of taking a nice rational actor approach, which I tried to, to do by helping found organizations that do guidelines, it went this weird direction. Um, and it's also personal because I see these patients coming in 
who have been to these clinics, and I know they didn't get their hip injected. I know they didn't get their knee injected properly. Uh, they think they got stem cells. They paid ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars for dead tissue being injected, um, and it 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 certainly pisses me off when I see that. I see people not getting what it is they were told they were getting. Um, and I'm scratching my head and I'm saying, where's the rational world I thought this would turn into? Where, where are the experts, the people spending the time, the energy, the resources to get educated in this uh, field? And they're out there. Believe me, they're out there. They're not only in Regenics. We found lots of good doctors that I would send my mother to that aren't in the Regenics network. But I know who those people are and you don't. And that's the problem. And that's why I write the blog is because I know who not to send my mother to, but I don't think that most people do. And it's very hard for them to figure all that out. So the blog is turned into, yeah, sometimes trying to police the industry, but it's really trying to take complex subjects and bring them down to easy things that people can understand so they don't get scammed or in this case, hurt. It's critical. It's uh, if you don't know of Dr. Centeno's blog, it is at regenix.com. You can click the word blog. You, you can and should subscribe to it. Stay well informed every single day. You can leave comments. You can ask follow up questions, but you can be sure that every day you are going to learn something that will advance your knowledge about the body, about medicine, about new techniques, about you know, what's working, what's not working, buyer beware, what to avoid, check it out. It is an amazing way to really stay well informed and continue your learning journey uh, so you can continue to have even more power. Let's go to Eric's question. He says, uh, are there any scientists doing limb-like foot biomedical engineering of lower leg and foot using stem cells? I'm not quite sure. Uh, say get doing Are limb any, something? Yeah. Uh, any scientist doing limb-like foot biomedical engineering of lower leg and foot? Biomedical engineering of lower leg and foot. I'm not sure I understand uh, the term you, you know myself. What, yeah, I think what you might be referring to, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is limb regeneration which uh, happens in geckos and other types of animals. And the answer is that's being intensively studied right now. Uh, and you know, scientists have identified many different pathways and stem cell types and what happens with those cells to allow limb regeneration to occur. We don't do anything like that. Uh, that's, and that's probably not something we're gonna see in humans for at least another decade or two. Uh, the good news is uh, it's being intensively studied, and we, we understand more and more every year about how that works in certain animals. Uh, the, the whole field of stem cells and uh, natural, as we call it, regenerative medicine, meaning you're regenerating your own body. Uh, if it were up to me, I would take the word medicine out of it because it's really about your own body, but it's a healthcare specialty, so people think of that as medicine. Um, but it really is about using your body to heal your body. It's the most natural form of healing possible. Um, and, and like mo most doctors, as Dr. Centeno is saying, the, the you know, rational actors, if we were thinking logically about this, about what's in the best interest for people, not what's in the best interest of pharma, not what's in the best interest of their employer or what's in the best interest of their monthly income, but what's in the best interest of people, we'd be having much different conversations about what healthcare is, means, and how it works all together. So uh, stem cells are the beginning of that journey. Right now we're in the phase of, you know, how do you heal your body's damaged tissues? Um, but you wanna take a moment to sort of explore kind of, I guess what I'll call the science fiction possibilities uh, of, of kind of, you know, the idea of, you know, I've, I grabbed a lizard when I lived in Florida and, you know, it shot forward and I had the tail in my hand. And, you know, it, when I was a kid and I wondered what's going on and, you know, then somebody said, oh, don't worry, they'll regenerate another one. You go, wow, that's a miracle. Why can lizards do it and we can't? Uh, part of it is DNA, but part of it is also, of course, the possibility of what we can do uh, with regenerative medicine. D do you want to 
you know, sort of extrapolate uh, what may be possible in decades to come? Yeah, so limber generation is actually one I've had a personal interest in just because uh, my wife's uh, adopted cousin uh, uh, was born in India and uh, without limbs, all four. Uh, so she doesn't have arms, doesn't have legs. And, you know, it's something that, that I remember talking to her about in the early 2000s because they were just starting to understand that process. And it's a complex process involving the right stem cells in the right places with the right chemical signals in order to make that happen. Um, and in the last 15 years or so, you know, let's say at that point I started talking to her about it, we knew 20% of how that worked. We're probably up to about 80% of how that works. So is it possible to replicate? Probably. Uh, then you get into other things, you know, super stem cells. So the concept of taking stem cells from a person uh, and then genetically modifying those to do all sorts of crazy things. Uh, I, I believe that that's coming. Obviously, there will be big safety issues there to work out, but I think we're going to see those issues uh, come here pretty soon. And if we back off of that, we've got someone else's stem cells in a vial. Again, as you've heard many here times before, there are no stem cells you can buy right now that are from someone else to use in you. Uh, if you're hearing that there's umbilical cord stem cells or amniotic stem cells that someone's trying to sell you, that's a scam. But we will see someone else's stem cells come on the market here probably in the next three to five years. So that's actually pretty close. Uh, there may be some rejection issues that are starting to be understood now with some of those products, but they may have very real uses in certain circumstances. Um, so that that's sort of a uh, very far out, intermediate, and then, you know, short-term view of the future of, of stem cells. It's uh, a fascinating field. That's why, uh, you know, it, it keeps us so interested. Uh, you know, you think about it and everybody who thinks, wow, that's crazy. How could that be possible? Uh, you know, ask yourself, uh, who grew your existing five fingers now? Uh, yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, it isn't that far fetched that if you made the first, you know, I'll say 10 uh, and your toe, you know, if you've had the ability, you've got the, the material, you've got the DNA map, you've got, you know, we've all come from literally two microscopic cells uh, and here we are. Um, that's science and medicine. That's nature at its finest. Um, unfortunately, our healthcare system has become so financially motivated that we don't look to enhance our natural abilities. Uh, we look to, they look to, if I'm not part of that whole deal, they, they look to find patented chemicals, procedures, or devices uh, that can command the highest profitability to, you know, basically in many cases, keep you dependent on the system. You know, drugs don't heal anything. They may suppress symptoms. Um, but they're not healing your body per se. Um, and so that's the system that we're in. And uh, it is fascinating to see what we can do. And I think that's really very much what you describe in terms of just the vision of the possibilities of the future. It's going to come from the demand of people who wake up and realize, wait a minute, we're being told and sold that there's a drug for everything, when in reality, we have such amazing potential to heal ourselves, protect ourselves, do things naturally that are that are innate or inborn to our abilities that we're skipping over in order to go right to the dangerous, expensive stuff. And there's a time and place for everything on the continuum, but let's let's not skip over all the natural things we can and should be doing to enhance our health and our healing before we get into the expensive stuff. I think that's the point here. All right, got a little bit of time left. Uh, let's see, we've got, where did we go? We got more questions coming in. Rico, Rico Honey Davis asks, how can I reach out for a consult and imaging for a possible CCI? What would you recommend somebody do if they have a possible CCI? Yeah, so the only place that really treats CCI on our network is Centeno Schultz. So that would be where you would go. Uh, you can just reach out to, if on the Centeno Schultz website, which should be, you can get to right there from our Facebook page. You can request a consult, get on the phone with the uh, education center. They can go ahead and get you on a telemedicine consult. That's the easiest thing to start with. 
Uh, because of COVID right now, physicians are licensed in all states until this pandemic is over. That's being done. It's obviously allowed doctors to go from point A to point B as they're needed, but it's also allowed us to, to do a, a traditional insurance cover type consult with somebody um, on a video link just like this. And that's the best place to start. If you need to get imaging that you don't have, we can usually write uh, scripts to get that uh, imaging done. All right, there you go. And uh, please do reach out, Rico. The information is all there. And uh, someone on our team might be able to private message you as well and get you the help you need as soon as possible. All right, Kimberly's, uh, hey, Kimberly. Uh, she says, I had an interventional injection by a surgeon after my initial herniated disc many years ago. It did nothing for me. Uh, ended up, I'll say nothing positive for you. Um, ended up having to have a microdisectomy. Wish y'all had been doing this for spines back then. Uh, yeah, uh, whether they were doing them or not, the key is how do people find Centeno Schultz and the Regenex mm -hmm. network? The answer is people speak up just like you. Now that you know, there's sort of an imperative to share with other people because even now that we do these things, we still get the same kind of feedback. Uh, I didn't know that that was possible. And the most common way that people find out about these procedures. This is primarily a referral-based type of discovery. Uh, nobody's got the money pharma has to basically buy out the media to convince you day in and day out that there is a drug, pill, device, or surgery for everything that ails you. Uh, it has become part of our cultural hypnosis. Uh, and unfortunately, those of us who are you know, awakened to the other possibilities really do need to take an active role in letting our friends, family members, coworkers, and other people we know, I'll say our social networks, know about these possibilities. But Kimberly, thank you for your feedback. Uh, she goes on to say, of course, Dr. Centeno is clearly passionate. He is one of the many things I love about him. I am too. That's why we love doing this program for you. All right, we've got Faye who says, uh, asks, has FDA been looking at freezing stem cells for future healing? What's the thought on that? Yeah, there is no FDA permitted stem cell banking service for adults right now. Now, there's there are companies floating the risk and doing it anyway. Uh, but as an example, you got to be really careful with that because we had one company in Florida, U.S. Stem Cell, that was doing that and was uh, recently shut down. And they were told to destroy all of those samples. So we had people that paid lots of money to give their get their fat taken have those cells grown, have those cells frozen. And then the judge came in and said, I don't care what you spent. Those are illegal drug products. They're all being destroyed. Um, so none of those patients had any access to those cells after paying all of that money. The company went bankrupt. I doubt they repaid any of that money to anybody. So we have companies out there right now that are trying to do the same thing. So be very, very careful with that. But there is no FDA legal way to take your cells and save them for future use right now in the U.S. That can be done outside the U.S., however. Uh, let me follow up with, is it, uh, it, what's your opinion on it being necessary? I mean, uh, as you get older, you still develop stem cells. Uh, is there a benefit or reason conceptually? Or, you know, as you grow older, you can still have these procedures and they're often quite effective. Yeah, you can still do these procedures, obviously, without saving your stem cells. Uh, there are situations uh, where we take actually patients down to a licensed site that we work with in Grand Cayman, where we can grow their cells to bigger numbers and save those for future use. So there are clinical indications where that makes sense. But about 90 percent of the time, we can do what we need to do here in the U.S., even if the patient is, is older. All right. Thank you for your question, Faye. Uh, Donna says, greetings from Florida. I'm a walking example of what Regenex can do for patients. I am a cheerleader, especially for Dr. Chris Centeno. He's been treating me for the past six years. He's treated both of my shoulders, my neck, spine, thumb, and most recently, my hip. For me, Dr. Centeno has been a godsend. I've avoided any orthopedic surgeries, and thanks to him, I've increased my quality of life. Donna, thank you very much for that. Those are wonderful ways. Obviously, Dr. Centeno's heart is warmed by the positive feedback. But more importantly than that, if I may say, people can hear from other people real experiences of 
what happens when you trust the best um, and what's possible when you trust the best and make the right decision to go to the you know world's foremost experts. That's really what this uh, ends up being. Doc, you comments for Donna? Yeah, well, Donna, thanks for saying that. Um, and uh, yeah, Donna's in Florida and she's been a huge advocate for what we do. She's made the trip to Colorado many times. Uh, and uh, so I'm happy that I, I've been able to help you. Uh, and moving forward, you know, happy to help you uh, continue to try to avoid surgery. We've treated her shoulders. Uh, she was told she needed surgery in one of the shoulders. Uh, ultimately, we got that healed. Uh, the surgeon then looked at the post MRI, was pretty impressed. Uh, Donna's husband's a physician, so he he also has kind of gone along with this whole thing. Initially, I think he was you know dragged into this thing, kicking and screaming, and then after a while, he's like, "Hey, this stuff seems to work." So it's been great to to treat Donna. Let, let me follow up with the question. You know, some people might be going, "Wow, that's a lot of things to treat." Um, let's talk about briefly the concept of you know injuries versus you know sort of early injuries and or in some cases being proactive altogether. We don't have a lot of time left, but uh, there is a continuum. People would say, well, why would you go to for so many different things? Uh, let me you know, just kick that over to you. When is best? Uh, do people have to wait until they're totally broken down, which is really the, the main philosophy is when you just can't take it anymore? And wh when should people be thinking about maybe doing these things early on proactively? Yeah, so Donna's a great example of that. Uh, she's had some acute injuries, like in the shoulder. She's very active in Pilates. Uh, and then she, she's also had some smoldering long-term issues in her back and neck that haven't necessarily been specific injuries, but those got injured a long, long time ago and just need some periodic maintenance work to keep them where they need to be. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, yeah, we have our patients try to focus on that proactive concept, which is little things uh, require little treatments, big problems require bigger pro uh, treatments. So if you catch these issues when they're small problems, uh, we can manage them or get rid of them with little treatments. If you obviously have to wait until they become big issues, then they require bigger solutions, including surgeries and things like that. So trying to be proactive about these things. Now, we we're all proactive with our cars, right? We certainly know that we shouldn't drive our car if it doesn't have enough oil in it. Or we certainly know that if there's smoke coming out the back, that's not good, we gotta get that checked out. Or if it's pulling to the right when you go 65 on the highway, that that's not good. Those are all things we'll get checked out early because we know that our car may not work or it may kill us in the process. Uh, but we don't tend to do that with our bodies very well or very much. So that's where we try to focus our patients Find little problems, have your doctor look at those and get those treated early. Simple philosophy. It's uh, worth doing. You know, the thing you got to remember is uh, unlike a car, the irony, of course, is, you know, if your car breaks down, you can replace it. Uh, when your body bear wears down uh, to the point that, uh, you know, it's not able to heal itself because you waited so long, uh, you don't get a second chance at, uh, you know, replacing the whole thing. So uh, it is, of course, ironic. That's why we keep on pushing as hard as we do. Last question for our day from Kimberly asks, uh, is it possible for PRP stem cell repair slash replaced burn skin tissue? You know, Kimberly, we haven't done a lot of burned skin work. Um, certainly, there's a lot of publications on wound healing and non-healing wounds in PRP. Uh, as far as burned skin that tends to be, depending on the patient, a situation where the collagen matrix is messed up and you tend to get that scarring and other things. So will PRP help with that? It may help it remodel a bit. I, I can't say I've got a ton of experience there. So um, PRP is used for skin applications. Uh, it's used for aging skin and things like the vampire facelift. It's used for non-healing wounds. So it, it may have some effect, but uh, it's not an area that I really specialize in. There you go. Thank you for your question. But Kimberly, it does tell us that you are thinking correctly. The question really is, what are the possibilities 
what is what are we capable of what's our potential uh, and then we look to find, you know, science to support those things. But your thinking is, you know, hey, listen, if my blood has all these healing factors in them, shouldn't they be able to heal different types of things? The answer is theoretically yes. Um, but we, again, not, uh, we, we, this is an orthopedic conversation specifically. And that's really what Dr. Centeno is a expert specialist, I'll even say inventor and founder uh, of in this category. Well, it's uh, unfortunately that time again. That's the end of our uh, program. We so appreciate your questions. We appreciate you joining us. We appreciate you sharing this with others, whether you're subscribing to the blog, whether you're watching videos with us on Mondays and Fridays, and hopefully sharing it with other people too, so more people have the ability to ask their questions and regain their power to be able to understand the real potential and ability they have to heal themselves naturally reduce their risk of dangerous drugs, expensive, dangerous surgeries, and so on. Dr. Centeno, any final comments for today? You know, we started with that whole fake injection thing. And again, I, I can't, this is one that goes beyond just sort of a fake procedure or, or not getting what you paid for and can move into the, to the really seriously dangerous in, uh, in those intrathecal or inside the spinal canal injections. So just be really careful out there because I, I was dumbfounded to see those videos. Uh, and I've I put one of them on LinkedIn, a little snippet of it. And I've had, you know, 50, 60 comments from physicians just saying, wow, that's amazing. I, I didn't know anything like that was going on. So, you know, there are times that we get surprised about how much danger you can be put in if you're not in the right hands. And that's the key. Get into the right hands. Find yourself a good chiropractor who's willing to stay in their lane and focus on helping you, especially early on with these, you know, orthopedic injuries that are early on, not yet ready for the next step with orthobiologics. That's the continuum here. That's why we work so well together. Philosophically, the goal is to keep you off of drugs, keep you out of the surgery suite if we can. Uh, and help your body heal itself naturally. That is a common theme between us, uh, but we have different ways, different tools of helping you do that. That's our program for today. We will broadcast on Friday from the Regenex Facebook page. Bring your questions, bring your family, bring your friends, bring your open minds. We thank you for watching. Until next week, stay well, be kind. Thanks for watching, everyone.